Well, I invite you to turn in your Bible to John chapter 19. We've, we've been here for a while. We're going to finish the chapter, I believe, talking about uh, the crucifixion, the centrality of Jesus Christ and his crucifixion. And I'll uh, just illustrate this um, by... If you could get me started there. The next slide, please, Michael. Uh, this should show a picture, yes, a picture of a slide. Uh, excuse me, of a church. Uh, well, it's a slide of a church. Um, it's a church in sliding because uh, it started out um, almost 100 years ago, and they just had a, a basic vision statement. Ours is a little bit more complicated. Kim uh, referred to that, but this one was uh, we preach Christ crucified. And godly pastors came through there, and uh, they preached the gospel, and Jesus Christ was the center, and there was growth, and there was uh, influence and impact on their society. But uh, gradually, uh, you can see some of these vines were growing up, and um, whenever the seminaries where they train pastors uh, start to get a little bit off the rails, Sooner or later, it shows up in the pulpits because that's where the pastors are typically trained. And uh, that's what happened here. They started saying, you know, um, this crucifixion thing, it's, it's ugly, it's bloody, it's messy. And, um, you know, let's not emphasize that so much. And so, uh, you know, a vine grew up and covered that word. But we still cre uh, preach Christ. And... Um, that went along fine for a while, and then the, the vine kept growing and covering up more words and stuff, and people would come along and say, well, you know, um, Christ wasn't the only historical figure, and he's not the only founder of a religion, and there's lots of people, and they named a few who are also wise people, and we could glean some things out of their life. So gradually, they quit preaching Christ, but they kept preaching but they were preaching uh, human philosophies, vain philosophies, false doctrines, and they were no longer Christ-centered, and they didn't talk about the crucifixion. And so it gradually became, instead of a focus for evangelism and s witnessing to the lost and getting the lost saved, it became kind of a social club, and maybe, you know, let's try to influence our world around here, but they really diminished why Jesus Christ established the church to begin with. And I think that's going on today a lot. Uh, you hear a lot about today, if you don't hear the words, you're, you're exposed to the ideas about the social gospel or a critical theory, critical race theory, a number of things where um, moving away from the exclusivity of Jesus Christ, but kind of keeping the trappings there a little bit and trying to improve our world. Now, there's nothing wrong with trying to improve our world, but if that becomes the focus of the church, we're going to be just like that little old church uh, happened. Gradually, we will die, and we deserve it. If we move away from preaching the gospel, if we move away from a, a centralized message on the crucifixion, and redeeming lost people and reconciling them to a holy God, if we move away from that, God will remove the lampstand from our church. And uh, I put up here some of the th examples of how that kind of starts to morph from a biblical gospel to a social gospel. Uh, first of all, the emphasis uh, is lost from the individual sinner. Then they start talking about society has some systemic problems and instead of holding the individual responsible and inviting that individual to receive Jesus Christ as their savior we try to fix society's problems evangelism moves from a proclamation of the gospel to a social action to civilize societies or to uh, correct or reform ours instead of justification it becomes justice the focus now let me hasten to add, I'm all for justice. Uh, the Bible talks about, Micah talks about, you know, what does God require, O oh man, to do justice, right? And to walk humbly before your Lord. He wants us to be participating in justice, but you know what? That is not the main focus of the church. It can be uh, a focus of some of the individuals in the church where they take on 
issues informed by God's revelation. But the church is to preach the gospel and to encourage Christians. It's a vertical relationship to God, is biblical gospel. Um, the social gospel is a horizontal, the brotherhood of man and the love of man and fixing our problems. Uh, salvation of an eternal soul becomes service for temporal well-being. The focus becomes not the other world that we're going to for eternity, but this world that we're going to try to fix up as long as we can. And um, the non-Christian forms of this don't even consider... Um, life after death they're trying to improve this life and we live as long as we can and we don't need a savior we'll fix our own problems um, again this the biblical gospel focuses on individuals the social on society um, we talk about the millennium there is going to be a perfect kingdom someday jesus is going to come back and for a thousand years he's going to fix it but guess what the problem is not our environment the problems are not our education the problems are not financial the problems are in the human heart of sin because even in that perfect kingdom for a thousand years with jesus as the king there's still a rebellion at the end perfect education perfect uh, environment perfect uh, um, provision by god of all of our needs and at the end there's still a rebellion why because there's going to be people in there with a sinful nature and the human heart is the problem. So uh, as people lose their focus in church on the crucifixion and the centrality of Jesus Christ, we move towards fixing society instead of redeeming souls. Now, I'm all for fixing society, the individuals. I've been involved in some things, and I certainly want us to be involved in voting and getting the word out and pro-life and all this kind of stuff but that cannot be the focus the focus has to be jesus christ look what happens when you introduce socialism and the social gospel these next few pictures are pictures of what used to be thriving churches and uh, the russian revolution came along and marxism and socialism by the way there was no communism anywhere in the world because communism means everybody has the same stuff equally, but how many of you understand in the Soviet Union there was some haves and there was some have-nots, right? So it wasn't communism, it was socialism. And that's right where we're headed if we don't participate in changing people's hearts one at a time, preaching the gospel. That's where we're going to see inroads. Here's another um, abandoned church in southern Russia. Uh, the Tula region in southern Russia. Uh, this was a Lutheran church in uh, Ukraine. Uh, here's one in Bulgaria. Here's one in Cyprus. Churches, if they lose their focus on Jesus Christ, they might as well close their doors. And in fact, God will see to it. And young people in particular, although I, I know some olders that are guilty of this as well, they want to bring in socialism thinking this is going to fix the problem. Socialism will clamp down on the churches overnight. Don't think you're going to have freedom and socialism. It never has existed anywhere in the world and it won't exist anywhere in the future. John Stott says this, the fact that a cross became the Christian symbol and that Christians stubbornly refused in spite of the ridicule to discard it is, uh, can have only one explanation. It means the centrality of the cross originated in the man, Jesus Christ himself. The cross was offensive to the Romans. The cross was offensive to the Gentiles. The cross was repugnant to the Jewish people. Then why did the church keep it as a symbol? Stott thinks it's because that's the way Jesus wanted it. I don't know. But I do know this. Preaching the cross will get you disrespected in society. But we have no option. There is no other way where people must be saved but the name Jesus Christ. Now, here's some of the ridicule that uh, has, this is from the first century. This was on the wall of an institute where it traded, uh, trained royal pages in Rome. And uh, I don't know if you've seen this. This will be a little bit more clear. That's our Savior. Crucified, a caricature of Christianity, our Savior crucified with a donkey's head. 
and the man next to him with his arm raised up is worshiping Jesus because there it says uh, Alexandrus worships his God and they mock Jesus Christ as a donkey. That started right in the very first century and it has not lessened and in fact it has gone more so that people today are ridiculing Christians. People are ridiculing Jesus. People are ridiculing the the cross, the gospel. And it's up to us, are we going to stand up for it and stand up to it by preaching in love and not in hate? Or are we going to be intimidated and close our door? Unfortunately, the corona thing has uh, participated or at least uh, exacerbated the problem. There are actually Christians who are backing off and closing their doors because some governor or some mayor somewhere told them to. I think we need to push back. I think we need to be open and visible and vocal as long as we can, nonviolent, but resist the temptation to be intimidated and close our doors. Let us not turn the cross into a metaphor, John Updike said, let us not mock God with metaphor, analogy, analogy, steps, uh, sidestepping, transcendence, making of the event a parable, a sign painted in the faded credulity of an earlier age. Uh, we will become embarrassed and intimidated and shut our doors if we don't maintain Christ and his centrality. In your notes, the first fill in there is the indictment of Jesus Christ. <coughs> um, a few years ago, an author, uh, Graham Tomlin, did a study, and uh, he dug up some research that had been done in the 60s, and he found some uh, research um, sur- surveying the God I want, the people, uh, what kind of God would you like? And uh, they had all kinds of stuff, and some of them quite um, famous people participated in this, and um, some of them wanted the kind of God that they could, uh, he would be kind and uh, the someone they can come to believe in, none of them, not a single respondent said, I want my God to be crucified. Because that is ugly. And they don't understand that's the very way that we can be saved is because of Jesus Christ and his crucifixion. Uh, <clears throat> the God I want is irrelevant. We have to deal with the God we have, the God who has revealed himself, the God of the Bible. During a um, recent Holy Week, a cross with a mocking sign was placed on the campus at Yale. Um, Underneath it was spray-painted R-O-F-L. Now, uh, for those of you in my generation, that means rolling on the floor laughing. On our college campuses... There are young people, impressionable minds, being told about the mockery of Jesus Christ. This cross can't possibly save anyone. The crucifixion was a hoax. He never really died, or he never really existed, or he never really conquered the grave. And so um, this was the first time in Yale these uh, mocking words had been associated with the cross. And according to the scriptural account... Uh, Pilate put some words on the cross himself. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, uh, in three different languages. So here we have chapter 19, verse 17. They took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two other men, one on either side and Jesus between. Pilate wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It was written, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Therefore, many of the Jews read this inscription because it was in three different languages, by the way, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. And the chief priests of the Jews were saying to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but that he said, I am the King of the Jews. And Pilate is about up to here with these religious hypocrites. And he answers in verse 22, What I have written, I have written. I believe that he couldn't have changed that even if he wanted to because that's what God wanted on the cross. 
Verse 23, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier, and also the tunic, and the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece, verse 24, so that they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to decide whose it shall be. And this was to fulfill scripture, they divided my outer garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots you know, um, just a little sidelight here. This is a pretty interesting <coughs> support for the inerrancy and inspiration of God's word. What do I mean? Well, Jesus, being a Jew, knew the Old Testament like the back of his hand, almost like he had written it, right? <laughs> and uh, he would know the prophecies regarding the Messiah's arrival. So he would be able to read Daniel and figure out the exact day that the Messiah was supposed to ride into Jerusalem. He would be able to re read Zechariah and know that the Messiah was supposed to arrive on a donkey. He would know a lot of Old Testament prophecies that he could, if he wanted, copy fraudulently and, and, and apply to his own self if he wasn't God. In fact, a lot of false messiahs did that. They tried to present themselves as the Messiah because of these scriptures. They always fell flat on their face because of that suffering Messiah part and the raising of the dead and some other things that they couldn't quite pull off. But Jesus could have copied these things. But there's no way he could have influenced what Pilate said or the Romans um, gambling for his garments or that upon his death they wouldn't break his bones, but they would throw a spear or stick a spear in his side. You can fake riding in on a donkey. You cannot control the circumstances around you, what other people will say and do if you're not God. So this gives me great hope. The, this uh, eyewitness testimony of what went on there, as John was there presently and he was writing this stuff down, and he took great pains to say this is based on uh, fulfilling scriptures. These prophecies, Jesus Christ did them. Verse 25, um, the statements of Christ. We'll just move right along here. Um, verse 25, Therefore the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his... M now, if you're keeping score, there's four women here in verse 25, and three of them are named Mary. So it gets a little complicated. But um, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, comma, Mary, the wife of Clopas, comma, and Mary Magdalene. So there's three Marys there. And verse 26, when Jesus then saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, that's John, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Um, I think we can take some great solace in this as well. Jesus Christ suffering right in the midst of the most excruciating, cruel form of execution, and he sees his mom there, and he's got some unfinished business. And uh, I'm not sure where his siblings were, his brothers. We are told that they didn't believe in him until after the resurrection. So maybe he didn't want to trust his mom, who was a believer, uh, into the care of a non-believing sibling. So he looks at John, the apostle John, who wrote this gospel, and uh, he says to him, verse 27, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own household. Can you imagine um, the excruciating pain he's in, the shame uh, hanging up there in the sun, almost naked, brutalized, and he took the time to uh, care for his mother and uh, put her into the care of his friend John. Um, I find hope in that, that um, you know God might be a little busy with world events, but he cares about me. When I'm struggling, I'm going through some difficulties, he's got my back. Um, he doesn't get tired. He doesn't go to sleep. He doesn't uh, ignore the needs of his people. And, and so he cares about you. 
I hope you can take some uh, hope in that. Not only uh, does he make a statement here about Mary and John, uh, he also makes another statement, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things had already been accomplished to fulfill the scripture, said, I am thirsty. Uh, some people estimate 200. I've found 100, I think, myself, uh, prophecies of the crucifixion. And Jesus has checked them all off, right? He came to the right place in the right manner at the right time with the right attitude and the right mode on the donkey and all this stuff. All of his qualifications, uh, he did what he was supposed to. Uh, they've gambled for his garments. They've uh, written certain things on his cross there, the indictment. And he says, well, everything is done except um, I'm supposed to say I'm thirsty. It's kind of interesting because the other, uh, Matthew and Mark, talk about him refusing when they offered him the painkiller, the vinegar. He said no. Why? Because he wanted to feel every ounce of pain to satisfy the wrath of God, paying for my sins. But here he says I am thirsty. The only reason was to fulfill scripture. It was predicted. Uh, I skipped over it, but Psalm 22, 18. Um, I thirst. The Gospels don't give us a lot about the suffering, but Matthew, excuse me, Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53, if you want to get a picture of the suffering that Jesus went through on the cross, that's where you go. Here, John is hitting the highlights to fulfill the scriptures. That's what he repeats all the way through here, to fulfill the scriptures. Verse 30, therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said uh, another thing that was supposed to be fulfill the scriptures. It is finished. What's finished? Well, all those prophecies, he has just checked off and fulfilled them. But really what he's talking about here is the payment that is necessary to reconcile a sinful world to a holy God Jesus just accomplished it. So please don't denigrate this by thinking you can add good works to your puny efforts and earn salvation. It's already been paid for. And any effort on my part to add works so that I could be somehow more acceptable to God is anathema to him. The third thing here is the execution of Jesus Christ, verse 31. Then the Jews, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for this was a high Sabbath, asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who was crucified with him. But coming to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead and they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen has testified. That's John. And his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may also believe. Remember, John is going to tell us in the very next chapter, uh, I could have told you a whole bunch of stuff about my friend Jesus, but I've just selected seven signs, and those seven signs... My goal is so that you will believe. Well, here's another one he's talking about. Um, verse 35, so that you may believe. For these things came to pass to fulfill the scripture. Not a bone of him shall be broken. Highly unusual in crucifixion. They would uh, come along and the, probably the same mallets that they nailed them to the cross. They would come along with these mallets and break their shin bones so that they could not push up on the nails and catch a breath. And so crucifixion was finally, you died by suffocation. They came to Jesus and said, hmm, he's dead already. But just to make sure, they thrust a spear into his side, and out came blood and water. Verse 37, and again another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they have pierced. You know, some say, well, Jesus didn't really die. Uh, he kind of passed out there on the cross, and they took him into the tomb, and he cooled off in there and kind of revived <laughs> and somehow pushed the stone away and then came out and, and, and convinced everybody he had conquered death. Well, that's 
silly. The Jews knew he was dead. They said, let's take his, can you please take his body off the cross? Uh, the Roman soldiers, who were, that was their job, execution detail. Hey, what are you doing this week? And I, I got to go kill some people. That's my job this week. They were experts at it. They did it efficiently. And there's no way in the world they would uh, tell Pontius Pilate, yeah, they're all dead, and risk one of them still being alive. So the Jews made sure he was dead. The Roman soldiers made sure he was dead. Um, to confirm it, they stabbed him. Um, the centurion who was in charge knew he was dead. In the old movie, that was John Wayne, by the way, just surely he's the son of God. Right? But, uh, John, who was eyewitness, knew he was dead. And then look at the next thing here. Um, the burial, verse 38. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. So Joseph knew he was dead. And here's another guy, verse 39, Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds of weight. Why was that? For his burial, he knew he was dead. So... Uh, this nonsense from unbelievers that Christ didn't really die is foolishness. He was dead, and everybody knew it. He was buried, and everybody knew it. And he was raised from the dead, and some people knew it. Now, a lot of people denigrate the cross. I kind of skipped over their docetism. Um, did Jesus really die on the cross? Well, that started way back in the second century. They said, well, he didn't really die. He swooned. And there are still bozos who are putting that in their books today. Islam said the same thing. He didn't really die. That wasn't really Christ up there. That was somebody else. Uh, in their book, the Koran, his name is Issa, Jesus. And it talks about him being a great prophet. But they said, no way did he die. Well, that's a false religion. That's a false gospel. Yes, he died. And was buried. <coughs> These two guys were experts in the field. And it's interesting. Uh, Nicodemus came at night. And uh, you know you can make a lot out of that. Um, it might be just because he was really busy during the day. And so was Jesus. And he wanted to have a dialogue with him. But he is the one Jesus said to this religious leader. In a long black robe perhaps even at night. You must be born again. Your pedigree, your intelligence, your religious uh, convictions and fervor does not get you into heaven, Nicodemus. You have to be born again. And Joseph says here in verse 38, he was a secret disciple. You know, we got a bunch of those. But here he finally came out of the closet and he took a stance. He didn't go to the chief priest, by the way, and ask for the body. He didn't even go to the soldiers who executed Jesus. He went to Pontius Pilate and said, could I have his body? You think Pontius Pilate would make sure, hmm, I better check. He might still be alive and this could be a plot. No, Pontius Pilate was sure Jesus was dead. And he gave this guy, and this is really kind of a reaction, I think, Joseph of Arimathea is saying, uh, to heck with the Sanhedrin. I'm going to take my stance with the Christians. I'm going to go straight to Pontius Pilate. And another scripture, Jesus Christ was crucified with criminals, but he was buried in a rich man's tomb. Well, here they come. Joseph of Arimathea has a brand new tomb. Nicodemus has all this uh, mixture here for the burial. And they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen wrappings with spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. You think there was a pulse? You think that he was wiggling in there? No, he was dead. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus Christ there. Isn't that amazing? all according to scripture. Why? For me and for you to be saved. Let me just close with this. I'm told um, this has actually been in some fashion turned into a song. I didn't know that, but the Charing Cross is, um, 
important intersection in the city of London. And uh, there's a statue of King Charles on a horse there, Charles I, since 1675. Uh, <laughs> evidently, they're not tearing down statues there just yet. But, uh, um, but it's significant because it is since uh, the 18th century, or the early 19th, has been considered the point where all distances from London are measured. And this, there's a story about a little boy who lived in London and was became lost. And he was wandering around, and a Bobby uh, interviewed him and said, you know, where do you live? I don't know. Uh, well, what's your name? What, what's your family's last name? I don't know. And so, well, how are we going to get you home? And the little boy said, I think if you can get me to the cross, I can find my way home from there. And I... I hope that that serves as an illustration to the you present. Uh, if you centralize, if you focus on the cross, God will get you home from there. Uh, don't be like Joseph and Nicodemus, you know, closet Christians, and they were nervous about the fear of man and how dangerous that is. We need to be courageous, filled with the Spirit, and speak out on what we know to be true share the gospel, verbalize the message on how people can be saved. It doesn't do any good to your lost neighbors if they just think you're a nice guy. You should be a nice guy, but tell them how to be a Christian. That's why Jesus has left us here. That's our job number one, is to evangelize the lost. He's building the church. He's going to take care of all that other prophecy later, but right now he's building the church, and guess what? We are his workmen. We are in the prophetic summer of harvest. And uh, I should have shared this verse with you last week, but uh, Jesus said to lift up your eyes and look at the harvest, for it's, it's white. It is ripe. God has prepared hearts. And people are getting saved uh, up and down the West Coast and around the world. W uh, let's have them get saved in South Siskiyou County. Let's preach the gospel. We're going to close with this song. I think uh, Isaac Watts, um, the third stanza, See from his head, his hands, his feet, Sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, Or thorns compose so rich a crown? The world mocks and despises the cross. To us, it's a source of life. His fourth stanza, Were the whole realm of nature mine That were a present far too small, Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. I started today by asking you if you are centered on Jesus Christ. And I will just end this message by uh, encouraging you again um, to give him your, your soul and your life and your all. Uh, he deserves it and the world needs it. People totally sold out to Jesus Christ is what's going to influence people. Somebody's going to come and ask you, hey, Bill, uh, give me a reason for the hope that you have in this chaotic world. And I'm not going to tell them about uh, some political solution or so that I've got something figured out or, hey, read this book. I'm going to tell them the one who has given me hope is the one who has conquered death and has commissioned us to take that message around the world. Do it in the power of the Spirit and let's see a harvest of souls before it's too late. Thank you. Let's close with a song.